And so while we're waiting for more people to join, I just want to briefly go over the, um, this is our home screen. So this is at wildfoodies.org. And, um, you know, you, there's the meetup link. Uh, we have over 5,200 um, members at this point, which is great. Um, we started in 2010, uh, and I started learning, knowing about 20 plants, and I started doing tours, but I, I made sure everyone understood it was collaborative, which was kind of a joke, but anyway, um, you know, I would spec out a place and um, make sure I knew where the plants were that I could talk about, and I'd read up on and that sort of thing, so, um, you know, from there, now uh, we have this master list of um, you no, know, 230 plus plants. And this is this list. So it's in the middle of your screen under plant list. The master list is very important. You click onto that. And that's the list that you really should print out and start circling all the plants you can identify now. And that builds up your confidence as time goes on. You'll be um, circling more and more plants. And, um, you know, and, and then you know, and each of these, by the way, you know, like garlic mustard, each of these is a plant profile that I put together. Uh, and I put them together um, with the source links, uh, starting out with PFAF, which is Plants for a Future, which is kind of the gold standard for foragers. Then it's eattheweeds.com. That's the Green Dean, who I personally like. Wikipedia. Then it, then it goes down to, you know, sometimes foraging Texas and other um, foraging Texas, that guy wrote um, the um, Idiot's Guide to Foraging, which is, which is really good. It, it's really a good book. Um, so, but anyway, so this gives you, um, you know, a, a little um, synopsis of the plant and with a lot of links that you can follow to learn more about the plant. Um, so, oh, great. I've got to go upstairs for a second um, uh, because for some reason an alarm went off. Um, but I'm going to stop the share and let um, Danny uh, introduce herself and tell uh, everyone about your website. I'll be right back. Okay. Another late being put on the spot when you're not expecting it. Um, I'm Lady Danny Morenick, and I am basically in with Wild Foodies, not so much for the foraging for food part, but foraging for medicinals. Um, I have a side business, Landed Gentris, where I make tinctures as well as soaps and other products. And a lot of um, the things that I'm exploring are based on what I'm finding with native weeds. It's been a really big challenge because if you do traditional herbalism, um, you're generally looking at the uses of cultivars. Um, and many of the things that I'm finding like ground soil that we're gonna discuss tonight, there really isn't a lot of information um, about how to use that medicinally or I should say there's not any recent information. I did have to go back several hundred years to find Brother Aloysius to um, get any kind of sense of what this was actually used for and how it was done. So that's how I tie into Wild Foodies. And we're just gonna do these 10 plants this evening. Um, for those of you that have been out with us on a tour, then you know we kind of discuss um, what you can do with it edibly, whether, you know, the root is edible or whether it's the leaves or what time of year you get it. Um, I also just throw in some information about what it can be used for medicinally, whether that's, um, you know, for a headache or whether sometimes the medicine is not in making medicine. It's just using the plant, um, eating the plant because it may have, or you'll find with most of the wild foods that the nutritional levels are majorly improved when you have the wild version versus the cultivar. So if you're eating spinach, um, that's one thing, but if you have say um, lamb's quarters, you're gonna have a naturally growing weed without pesticide that pops up everywhere. That's gonna be higher in your vitamin A and C and iron levels. So it's always good to know about these things because then you can, even if it's only a matter of fleshing out what you already have for dinner, it's great to be able to go outside and dig up something or find something very easily and incorporating it into your healthy diet and lifestyle. Yes, exactly. And um, so, so let me go back to the, um, also I wanna say that um, Danny and I started um, doing our tours together. Well, actually she would come on the tour and she came on so many tours and I'd say, Danny, what do you, what do you have to say about that? And she had so much to say that I just, 
we just started, it, it just evolved uh, into a, you know, uh, um, uh, a, a really good partnership uh, where it, I can um, meander around about the edible, but um, Danny goes for the jugular on the exact specific um, uh, um, medicinal qualities. And I don't know if she told you, but her background is in, was in, or is, was in pharmaceutical marketing. And so she's, um, you know, she's very good at getting to the, getting to the point, which I'm not so great at sometimes. So why don't we, um, let me just go back to the screen share and to, uh, to uh, I want to go back to the, the main page for a moment, because we're going to basically be on the master uh, list of plant profiles, but they are, um, they are divided up in different ways. This is the uh, plants by uh, parts, by edible parts, um, lookalikes, which is always helpful. Uh, when you're trying to um, discern one um, thing from another, um, again, the roots. So these are this website is really set up for you to educate yourself. And um, that's the whole point of it. Now, over here on the right-hand side, I have the Iffy Edibles. We're going to be uh, finishing up with some of them, the Lesser Celandine Star of Bethlehem and the Ground Soul. Um, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, let me just see, going back. Uh, here we go. Um, so let's, let's, uh, sh Danny, do you want to get started? Uh, sure. We've got 19 people now and what I'm looking for time thing. Uh, it's 11 after. So. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get started and um, let's, let's start with the um, Japanese knotweed. So here we go. Um, the Japanese knotweed I have listed under grass. So um, it's it's here uh, on the on the list. So this this page is divided into plants, vines, bushes, and trees. So if you go down the plant side, I also try to gather them together. Now a real botanist will probably look at this list and go nuts. But um, so here we have the Japanese knotweed. Uh, click on to that. Um, and and uh, let me just say that uh, here here we go. Um, that's it, it. This is the shoot coming up. So roots and shoots. That's those are really great things to keep in mind because the shoots come up in the spring. Sometimes they come up in the fall as well, depending on the plant. And and so spring and fall is when you're looking for your shoots and your roots. Uh, sometimes, uh, although generally it's fall for the roots because you can see where the plant has been more easily than after a whole winter has gone by. But if you look at the Japanese knotweed. So, you know, I don't want to get into the invasives too much um, or non-natives is what I call them. But on our, um, again, on the front page of the website, I have a um, link to um, invasives or um, uh, evolution. And so it gives a couple of books you can read on that um, counter this invasive, you got to nuke it with chemical uh, reaction to um, non-native plants. Uh, that said, Japanese knotweed are interesting because they do not, um, most plants I find 5%, uh, if you wanna get rid of a plant, let's just say that 5% household vinegar will do it. Just put it on straight into the evening, that sort of thing, don't let it uh, um, evaporate away. Uh, Japanese knotweed, um, you'll weaken them, but boy, they're tough customers. So Japanese knotweed is probably the number one invasive that people or uh, parks and, and uh, preserves have the most trouble with because their root system is extremely tough. Um, but that's not to say that vinegar won't uh, eventually destroy it. That said, uh, this comes up, it's interesting, when it first comes up, usually the um, stalks are not so thick. They can be very spindly, so not I like them thicker in a way, uh, but um, but they look like this, which really looks like asparagus to me, and um, and so you just snap them off. Um, now sometimes, uh, and this happened at Albury where um, where the Weavers Way, um, I think they they cut down a patch, and uh, that was kind of cool because when they cut down the patch of Japanese knotweed, then all these um, new shoots came up. So. I think with Japanese knotweed, as with some other plants like uh, pokeweed, if you cut it down, you'll, you'll like three times, you might get these um, 
new sp uh, new shoots coming right back up again, uh, which is is good. Um, so, oops, sorry. I knew that was there. Oh, this is not the one that has been uh, refreshed. Let me refresh it. Um, this is a close up look at, this is perfect. This is a perfect time to, to um, harvest is when these, before these uh, leaves have actually unfurled. Um, that's, a, that's a perfect time to snap it off. And when they unfurl, you know, there, there you go. That's notice the spotted um, uh, stem little bit of reddish there at the joint. Um, and then as they grow older, and this is one with the, with the flowers uh, as well. Um, I don't know why this thing is in my way, but it is in my way. It keeps coming down. Um, okay, and then this is how big they can get. There's a little girl. <laughs> and it, it's huge. So it, it's, it's like in the bamboo family, it's very, um, it's, it's, it can get quite large. Um, okay, uh, so what's the taste? The taste is um, um, a very pleasant lemony taste because of the oxalic acid. It's, it is used as a substitute for rhubarb. Um, here's a, a, a very a brief comments on it. Um, you can cook it like asparagus. Uh, you can throw off the water if, if it's too bitter. Um, and, I would go for, you know, again, the young, the young shoots. I've seen people eat the, the stalk when it's much older. I'm not sure if I would, um, uh, I would recommend that. But also when you cook it down, by the way, it has a mucilaginous uh, texture to it. So think okra. And um, so, uh, you know, some people would like that for sauces or soups or thickeners, things like that. Um, Okay, so um, so Danny, why don't you uh, take it away? Okay. Alrighty, so Japanese knotweed, Polygonum cuspidatum, um, also known as Rhinutria japonica or Huzang in traditional Chinese medicine. Now, when you see this picture, um, you can one of the things that we use medicinally are the rhizomes, which is like the tuber that's underneath. Um, as well as the shoots. It's naturally anti-inflammatory. It helps with microcirculation. And those things can help with a number of other illnesses um, because inflammation can be what triggers a lot of things in the body. So it's helpful for chronic issues like psoriatic arthritis, lupus, and Lyme disease. If you notice um, around these joints, the uh, red- uh, Danny, yes? uh, I, I don't think you're screen sharing. I don't see it. Did you, let's see. I don't see the screen share. I, I got rid of mine. Um, Maybe that was holding up. Yeah. You see it now? No. Oh, it's coming up. Okay, I see okay. it. Great. Good. Um, so if you look at these, the redness of the joints and also these little leaves that are slightly heart-shaped, that kind of feeds into the old theory by Paracelsus, which was the doctrine of signatures, which meant that plants generally did the things that they looked like. So if you're looking at the heart-shaped leaves, that kind of gives an, in, an indication that it works on the heart. And because it does contain resveratrol, it's a natural antioxidant and it also drives down blood pressure and lowers cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So um, the heart-shaped leaves indicate the fact that it's good for your heart, uh, it's got the antioxidants. And then if you look at the redness on the stems, that kind of gives you an indication that it's good for inflammation, especially inflammation in joints. And that's what it's really um, used well for. There's also a belief that it may protect the brain from disrupting beta amyloids, which form the plaque that causes Alzheimer's disease. When I said that it helps with microcirculation, one of the things that a lot of herbalists like to do is mix this with ginkgo because one is for circulation and then the other one helps to fire up everything. So if you're dealing with cognition issues, this is something that's being studied. 
Knotweed is also really good for the blood system overall. So um, it's a blood purifier. It helps to regulate blood sugar. As I mentioned, it helps to bring down blood pressure and it's also a hemostatic. So if you are having issues with bleeding, then you can use uh, Japanese knotweed to stop that. The only thing that you have to be uh, mindful of is this may be contraindicated if you're dealing with a lot of blood thinners. Generally speaking, if you're going to have it as a tea or if you're going to eat it as fresh, it's not going to be so much of an issue. But if you start making things like tinctures out of the roots or the shoots, then you may have an issue. So just um, be mindful of that. You may also um, want to give this a miss if you are on what they call narrow window index drugs. So if you are on medications that have to stay at a certain level in your blood system, like um, for epilepsy or for any kind of bipolar disorder, then you might want to just give this a miss because it can interfere with the enzyme that helps with the absorption of that. But otherwise, you can feel free to enjoy knotweed, and uh, it's a tasty springtime snack. I was looking for it the other day, hoping that we might actually see some shoots, so. Excellent. Uh, any questions on the Japanese knotweed? Has anyone tried it? Uh, let's see, let's, let's get that. Okay, I don't know if I've, okay. So let's go back. Okay, so now we're gonna go to, um, whoops, wait a minute. Mm. Okay, screen share. Okay, we're going to go to uh, our next uh, plant, which is the fiddlehead fern. I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, here is what it would look like. You know, that this is the uh, basically what you buy at the store or farmer's market. Um, this is uh, the fiddlehead unfurling. Uh, it's all also called ostrich fern, and basically it's the great big fern you see out in the uh, parks and wilderness. And uh, the root is also supposed to be edible, although I have no experience with that. Looks like a pretty hairy mess. Um, but at any rate, so um, uh, so so basically, I think that it's important. It says rootstock needs to be uh, peeled and roasted. Um, and I think that it's it's very important um, to cook. Um, it, I have raw and cooked there, but I would recommend cooking it. Uh, um, I have eaten it raw, but um, I think cooking is, a, is the better idea. And it says the roots peeled. Um, and, and below we've got a lot of, uh, you know, again, uh, the links that you, where you can learn more about this. I think people are pretty familiar with the fiddlehead fern, but it's important to know that now, you know, I think we're a little early to start looking for it, but, you know, keep your eye uh, peeled for that. No pun intended. Here we go. And Danny, do you want to, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, let me. Okay, this is the larger picture of it mm -hmm. for ostrich fiddlehead. Matuchia struthiopterus. Um, with this, there is a specific part like Lynn was saying about using um, for medicine. And when you do it, it's kind of the inner bark, like Lynn said, when you go kind of down to the root. So it has to be, it's the inner white part. I, I do have a fiddlehead here, but unfortunately um, it's, 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 it's a small plant and I'm not gonna be able to show you the interior that they're talking about. But that's pretty much the only part that's used medicinally. But what happens is you would make a tincture of that and then it works as an analgesic for pain. It helps with inflammation. It's got antioxidants and it's antiviral. Um, this is one of those cases that if you're making it up as medicine, you just want to make it as a tincture and then you can use it for things like um, backache or you can make a strong tea and use it as a gargle for sore throats. Um, the base has been poulticed and then used for things like boils. And at one point I understand it was being used by midwives um, to kind of clear the afterbirth. So they would give this as a tea or they would do a poultice and lay it on the stomach in the hopes that it would help move the afterbirth after um, birthing a child. 
<laughs> um, but but if you're going to just enjoy fiddleheads, and um, one of the things I people would do them for me before, or I've had instances where friends of mine have sent me tins of them that I didn't realize that water had to be thrown off of these when you cook them in the same way that you have to do with poke or other ones that tend to be a little noxious. So um, that was something new that I learned, but they're really high in vitamin A, C, and rich in potassium. So of course your A and C are your antioxidants, so that helps with skin and hair. And it's just one of those cases where let food be thy medicine and eat these suckers while they're out because they become a major delicacy in the same way that ramps used to be considered a very impoverished food, but now they're all the rage. Right, right. Okay, so let's, uh, all right. Uh, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Please um, let us know. Any questions on the fiddlehead fern? Yes, um, Peggy. Yeah, I mean, because there's a lot of ferns out there. How do you know? Like, I have ferns growing in the side of my yard, but they're probably not. And I would love to grow fiddlehead there instead of those ferns that are there that are probably not fiddlehead. Right. So, they, so if there are like a million ferns out there, how do you know? Yeah, I think it's only the fiddleheads they really recommend for this, um, for, for eating. And they're the giant ferns, basically, the ostrich ferns. So um, if you've got something a lot smaller, um, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but the other thing is you could, you could also just replace the ferns you have with fiddlehead ferns. Just buy. Can you, can you buy, can you buy yeah. fiddlehead fern plants oh, sure. somewhere? Yeah, you okay. can buy fiddlehead ferns. Yeah, sure. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Yeah, it, that's the thing about shoots is you got to get them at a certain time and fiddleheads for sure. You know, uh, now I've got a couple fiddlehead ferns growing in a in a basket, or at least I did uh, for a couple of years now, they keep coming back. So they seem to be pretty hardy. Once you get them going like daylilies, they- They, they do, but you have to, I mean, they really, this was like dead and they really come back in the spring. So um, I had this guy under a cloche and he came back, but yeah, that's yeah. what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so we're gonna do the screen share again and I'm gonna go back to um, the, uh, so the next one we're doing is, is kind of interesting, uh, the daylily, because a lot of people, you know, uh, talk about the daylily and say, oh yeah, the daylily, that's edible. But a lot of us, when we get together, really talk about it. it the daylily has a back taste that is a little annoying, you know, and um, it doesn't fill me with confidence, this taste. And maybe Danny can get into that in a minute. Um, so the, the, for, for my own um, experience, which is limited with daylilies, um, I, I, I like them when they're just coming out, when they're the shoots. You just want to make sure you're getting daylily and you're getting the wild kind. You're not getting iris and, um, and you're not getting a cultivar. Um, and uh, the Green Dean makes a big deal of that. Um, uh, now, we're going to talk about hostas in a, in a few minutes. And with that, it doesn't matter if it's a cultivar, they're all edible. But with daylilies, um, the Green Dean of eattheweeds.com uh, does, does make an exception. And so he's, he's recommending you just stick. So the, the wild ones are basically the yellow ones. I mean, not the yellow ones, the orange ones. If you get into the yellow ones or the double flowered ones, you know that's a cultivar. Um, so, and again, you know, um, so, so, so now, you know, they'll be coming out of the ground very shortly. And, um, and this is the time I think they're the most edible where they give you that least amount of back, um, back taste. Um, okay. So here, here are, um, the roots, uh, as well are, um, edible. Uh, again, um, I don't have a lot of experience with the roots. So, um, you know, just, just so that you know, but they are sizable roots, to be honest. So if you can make, uh, you know, food out of that, that's, that's always to the good. Here are, um, they, let's see, once they get this, this height, they're too big. The shoots really have to just be coming out of the ground, maybe, you know, this much, I would say is I ideal, six inches or so. Um, but the flowers um, can also be eaten. Um, as, and, and this is one of these old fashioned drawings as to what's going on here. Uh, but they use the flowers for uh, soup thickeners as well. It has a mucilaginous quality to it, as does the shoot. 
Um, so um, it's 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 uh, it's one of these plants that people have in their landscaping. So when you landscape your yard, you can landscape it with wild edible plants, and it still looks like a beautifully manicured landscape property. It's just you're using wild plants to do this with, and there's plenty out of the 230. Believe you me, there's plenty of plants, trees, and bushes that you can use that are wild and edible. You don't have to go for the um, cultivars. Um, and so, so the early spring is the time to do this. Um, and, and Danny, why don't you uh, take it away? Okay. Here we go. Alrighty, so the day lily or day lily is Hemerocollis fulva. And that actually comes from the Greek uh, Himero for day and Kalos for beautiful, because that's really what they live for one beautiful day. Um, the parts that are used are flowers and the rhizome. Um, as Lynn showed you, the rhizome actually has like several nodes on it. So if you want to make sure, especially before it comes to flower, if you're trying to harvest the rhizome, if you pull it up and it does not have all those rhizomes on it, like looking like a, a bunch of clumps, then don't play with it because then it could be iris, which could be very toxic for you. So these are used as an anodyne, which just means it helps relieve pain, an antiemetic to keep you from vomiting, antimicrobial, antispasmodic, so if you're having cramping, diuretic to remove fluid from your body, and as a sedative. Um, now with the flowers, you can eat those and they are naturally um, work as a diuretic as well as to drive fever down. It also works as a mild laxative as well as stopping stomach cramping and vomiting and is mildly sedative. So put that all together and that makes it a perfect foil if you're having any kind of a food poisoning issue because usually with that, you don't feel great. You have stomach cramps, you, you know, if, you do, if you're not going to the bathroom with diarrhea, then you kind of want to get whatever is negative in your body out. So it's helpful in flushing that. This one has also been used um, historically as for women who are suffering from pain in childbirth, this was one of those things that if they saw it in the spring, they would feed you a flower or make a simple tea out of it to help ease that. The juice of the root was actually used um, for arsenic poisoning. So uh, that's something to keep in mind if you have enemies. Um, extracts have also been shown to have anti-tumor activity. So I know that there are some uh, companies that are looking at this for you know use for cancer treatment. But one of the oddest and I think um, most telling uses of the daylily, because this does exist um, in many places in the world, is it is actually, um, I can't say a cure for, but a treatment for um, filariasis, which is, it, it's a rare tropical disease, but it's spread by mosquitoes. And when they bite you, then you develop this like thread-like worm which generally people can recover from, but it can lead to swelling of tissues. So if you've ever seen from those old National Geographic pictures of people with elephantitis, where their skin gets thickened and then they get calves that are just like one big long elephant foot um, and it's blown up, that's what this will actually help prevent. And since there is no cure, what the recommendation is, is if you live in Southeast Asia or if you're in an area where this is a problem, then you'll want to consume a few of these before the season begins so you don't get it because it's easier, you know, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Are, are, now, were you talking about the flower? Yes. The flower. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about the daylily? Anybody? Okay. All right, so then we're going to go um, back to the um, to the screen, and uh, we're going to go on to the hosta. Um, so that would be hmm, okay, right here. Um, so the hosta. Oh, just to remind you what the hosta is all about. Um, a lot of people have hosta in their yard, um, and uh, and this one's huge, it looks like. So the, the hostas can be as big as a plate or, or they can be smaller. I call them nature's taco shell uh, because when they're unfurled, you can put food in them and wrap it, you know, do a wrap and then eat it, um, leaf and all. Although uh, generally speaking for um, chef's purposes, they're more into the uh, shoots 
And here the leaf, as you can see, is all um, uh, furled up. It hasn't unfurled yet. So um, what they do is snap it uh, at ground level and then they cook it. I understand, I, you know, I haven't actually done this yet, but um, they say it doesn't unfurl. It stays um, uh, wound uh, tight. Um, but this is this is uh, basically what it what you're looking for. Um, this is probably what the natural hosta look like from Asia, um, just growing naturally. It probably looks something like this. Uh, but we have you know lots of you know hundreds, if not thousands, of cultivars or hybrids. Um, you know uh, different looks, as you can see here. Uh, so the whole um, the 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 whole ground up of the plant is edible you know the um but not the roots but the uh, the shoots the leaves the stalk the buds the flowers um are all edible to me it all has a kind of a um a green bean taste a slight back taste like the daylily but not not as bad as a daylily um but um but anyway so it would be great if you just uh had that and put it so you can cook it or you can eat it raw. Um, and, um, you know, you can put in like chicken salad or any tuna salad or whatever you want to put in uh, into the, the leaf. And then just like I said, roll it up and eat it. Um, it likes the shade um, and, and does quite well. Um, it doesn't, uh, it, it will um, spread a, a bit on its own. Uh, but it's not invasive the way it spreads. Um, so I now have here cooked the lid off. If you want to minimize oxalic acid content, there is a, a bit that we have to keep in mind with the oxalic acid that lots of things have oxalic acid in them that we eat every day, like spinach. And um, so um, if you eat a balanced diet, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, okay. And so again, this is these are the flowers. And they are they are very edible, so it's nice to take the buds and cook them up, you know, and you get a nice crunchy taste of that, you know, if you want to saute it. Um, so so there they are. I, I do want to say something about uh, flowers and um, and their nutritional level and pollen and all of that because we're we're sort of raised to think pollen is always a problem, but actually pollen's a nutrient, and a lot of people into bodybuilding and things like that, or, um, you know, they take pollen capsules. So, um, so it depends on where the pollen is coming from, I'm sure, but um, it could be definitely a, a nutrient. Um, so Danny, would you like to take it away? Okay. So. Uh, alrighty, so with hostas. Hostas really are not used medicinally at all, um, but that's not to say that at some point somebody didn't poultice it just because um, the leaves are so large. If you're trying to get heat to a body part, it might be, a, you know, have been used to put something warm in just to hold onto like your knees if you have achy knees or joints. But generally speaking, there isn't a lot of information about use for you know, any medical purpose. But culinarily, hostas, the hosta Siboldi and hosta Montana are two of the favorites of chefs because their taste is milder. And this has actually become like a really big cash crop, especially in Asia, because the furled ones, which are called hostans, are considered, you know, an absolute delicacy. So many places now will grow these in greenhouses and they do what they call blanching, which is kind of keep them out of bright light so that they stay tender and they don't become too big. Um, when hosta leaves get bigger, they tend to get tougher, um, but you can still use them because you, a lot of people don't think about it, but you can throw them into smoothies. So that like takes all the problems with it being, you know, grainy or tougher right away. But hostas are fantastic because they're high in potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, manganese, and even higher in all of those nutrients than your traditional asparagus. So it's a great way to eat something that's probably in your yard anyway and get the medicinal benefits um, just from the natural vitamins and minerals that this is introducing into your diet. Yeah, the interesting thing about um, hostas is that um, you can, um, if you're at a nursery or whatever, I mean, not that you're 
actually you don't want to do this, but um, but you can nibble on it and each hostas, um, uh, species of hostas is going to have a different taste. So and a different, um, you know, thickness or toughness or, you know, so so you have to sort of decide uh, which which kind of hosta you want in your yard or you want to put in planters or that sort of thing. And so you, you want to nibble, you know, you want to try the shoe on before <laughs> you buy it. So you want to uh, nibble a bit and make sure that's the hosta for you because they do definitely have different tastes and, and different textures. And there are like 43 varieties and I think over 200 different like, you know, subspecies of those. So you got a lot of tasting to do. Right, right, right. So um, yeah, and um, uh, again, Aubrey Arboretum has a, a big selection of hostas they grow in the back. So they're, they're kind of interesting. And um, uh, I live near uh, Washington uh, Square and um, you know, every so often they thin out their hostas. And so I've taken them at times, you know, and just, you know, distributed them to friends and, and that sort of thing. So, um, so sometimes you'll find that that people are just giving them away. Um, okay, so our next uh, plant is a uh, cleaver. Um, so I'm gonna get up on that screen share again and go back um, to the uh, cleaver. Now, um, here we go. It's down here, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, the cleaver is, um, it comes up in the spring. Now it's, uh, it, this is a, a drawing of it, um, but here we have a closer look. Um, and this is what it looks like in the spring. And, and you can already see a little bit around those edges, uh, the problem with the cleaver. And that is, and let me go over here to so you can get a really good close-up look. So isn't that spooky? <laughs> so, so as it gets bigger, those those little um, those are like little hooks. Actually, there's a little hook there at, that people don't. Act, I don't even know if you can see it. Yeah, it's hard to see. But um, let me get. Uh, there's. I haven't even. There we go. See that? See the little hooks. Uh, and that's why it cleaves unto you, you know, uh, when you when you're talking about, you know, that. Um, and this is this is uh, these are the the fruit um, uh, that have turned dark, and this is what is used as a coffee substitute. So cleaver is really only good to mainly good to eat, I think, as a spring uh, shoot. You know, when it's first coming up, when it's really young. And then you have to cook it because otherwise it just scratch the heck out of your throat. Um, and here's another picture of what it, this doesn't look as hairy, but it is. This is a smoother looking kind of picture. Um, but here it is. Uh, let me go back here. It gets a little bit of a, a, um, a white uh, four petaled blossom to it. Um, and and this is what we normally see. This is when it's gone crazy in somebody's yard. And, um, and so it really just sticks to everything. You just throw it at somebody and it just sticks all over them. Um, so uh, that said, uh, so it, um, it basically, I think the taste is, um, it's a little bitter. Um, again, the coffee substitute, although I've never used it that way, those, uh, those fruits are really, really, um, small. Um, and, um, basically I think it's got a, it, it's got a lot of interesting nu nutritional and medicinal, um, medicinal, uh, qualities. Now I have it, uh, looking like carpet weed. So I want you to see this because carpet weed is, so carpet weed looks very much like it. Um, again, a little, uh, here we go. That gives you the idea. Now, carpet weed, cleaver comes in the, um, there's another carpet weed. That's not such a great, that's not such a great picture. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that um, uh, carpet, oops, I went back to carpet weed. Uh, cleaver is, likes the cold weather. And carpet weed likes the hot weather, but they look very similar. Um, but carpet weed uh, doesn't really stick to you uh, like the, the cleaver does. Um, but it's, it's interesting how sometimes we find similar looking plants, but one only likes the cold weather and one 
likes the, the hot weather. And that's the case with the cleaver carpet weed um, situation. They're very similar looking the way they whirl around the stem of the plant, um, the leaves do. Uh, but, um, you know, one again is more, you know, your cold weather. And then it, during the process of the summertime, it just goes crazy and then dies back. Um, okay. And Danny. Okay. Oh, did I ask if anyone had any questions about the hosta? Did anyone have any questions about the hosta? No, okay, we're not gonna. Okay, we're on to the gout weed, I mean the cleaver. Cleaver is gallium aparine. Um, cleavers, the, all the aerial parts, so the stem as well as the leaves and the flowers can be used. It's, it's anti-inflammatory and it's a refrigerant, which means that it helps to cool. And when you get the fact that it's it's tightening it helps reduce swelling and it's cooling that makes it perfect for skin so if you're having skin issues um, it also has an ability to treat infection it can be taken as a tea or as a tincture and tea is really easy because even though it has the hooks on that once you put hot water over it everything like dies back really easily so it makes for a quick tea that tastes green it doesn't taste much of you know nothing to write home about um, but by drinking the tea, it can also help with arthritis, with um, swelling of lymph glands, any kind of swelling or condition that's going to have inflammation tied up with heat. So if you have tonsillitis or UTIs or mono or um, glandular fever, any of those things, it will be helpful for that. It can also help to lower your blood pressure. And um, I've actually used it a bunch of times, um, not only as a drink in the spring, but also in skin salves and just infusing it in oil. Um, the only thing is when you're infusing a plant like this, because it has a fair amount of fluid in it, you're going to need to dry it before you infuse it in oil or do a process where you're kind of actually cooking the plant in oil to get the best use. But because of the vitamin C levels, as well as the ability to quell inflammation and fight infection and to cool things off, it's a great thing to make up now so that if you have issues with bug bites or any kind of burns later on, you have something on hand to deal with it because it also works well for things like um, burns or for eczema or psoriasis. Oh, cool. So interesting. Um, okay, so uh, any questions? Any questions about the cleaver? I do, just real quick. Mm -hmm. Did you say that you dry it first or do you just... Uh, do the oil, the hot oil when you put it. You can do the hot oil thing. I personally, um, hot oil would probably be better only because um, cleavers, unless you have a really healthy big bunch of it, like when it's starting to come out now, it's going to be thin and small. So yeah. by the time you put it in a dehydrator, you're going to have nothing. Yep. Um, but if you're going to tincture it, uh, it's perfect to do it now and you don't need to worry about the you know, liquid content, because as long as you're using 100 proof vodka or uh, grain alcohol, then that will compensate for the water content and you'll be okay. Cool. Thank you. So, so Danny, are you saying that, um, so it's good to, better to eat and cook first, as far as I'm concerned, um, the cleaver in the spring, but in the, uh, when it gets bigger, that's the time to harvest it for the medicinal, um, now, if you're, if you're using it now when it first comes out, then you can use it for tincture. But I'm just saying if you want to dry it for later use. Right. Okay. So it should be older if you're Yeah, if it's too it. early, then it's just going to nothing. Okay. Got it. Can you use it for a sunburn? Yes. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. The sun, it, so, so could you use it before, before you get it, go out into the sun or? You would probably have to make either a tincture or tea, or um, if you're making your own products, you know, getting it into something that you can use pre-sun that's going to also preserve your SPF factor and all would be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so what I would say is um, if you are unfortunate enough to get sunburn, make it up as a really strong tea and spray it on you. That's probably the easiest, most direct route to get it to you without adding anything else. But um, you can always certainly make it up into a body butter and just hold it for an after sun treatment. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. All right, so now we're gonna go back and our next one will be, okay, we're going into gout weed and I have it under carrot parsley like. <laughs> that's, 
<laughs> oh my word. Uh, so, um, okay, so goutweed is one of my favorite plants. Um, this is uh, kind of an interesting uh, uh, drawing of it. Uh, but this is what it's going to look like coming up new out of the ground. It's going to be really small, shiny leaves, three parts to it. Um, and th this is what it looks like. It's also in that family. The uh, uh, So, and here are the roots. Nice uh, job with the roots. Now it spreads. It does spread. Uh, but I love it because I have just an alley in the back of my house. So I have to put everything in pots and I need uh, plants that are really hardy and tough and and will uh, survive anything uh, and this is one of them and um, and so I use it all the time kind of as a parsley substitute here are the flowers and this is where you know um, the 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 lookalikes with the um, you know the poison hemlock come in you want to be careful of anything that has this kind of a, a blossom so you want to be sure that You've got that. Now it also comes in a variegated um, spe uh, mm. species, so um, that some people have that. Um, I just like it as is. Um, it's also called a uh, ground elder or bishop goutweed, basically because they used it to um, combat gout. But I'll let uh, Danny get into that. Again, um, it to me it just tastes like parsley, and that's how I use it as an as an herb. And I just stick it in everything. I just, I just love it. And particularly if I'm making a rice dish or pasta dish and things like that, it's just great to throw that that in there. And it's something I can I can grow in the city, which is you know again it's it's so uh, there are things you can grow, but it's uh, it's it's more difficult um, than living you know where you have a yard and and you can do more with it. Um, let me just think. Uh, okay, Danny, you're. It's on to you. Okay. Alrighty. So next up, goutweed, a geopodium podagraria. Um, actually, in Greek, uh, a geopodium means goat, and podium means little foot. So um, that's and that's the reason why is if you look at the leaves, it's kind of hard. Oops, there. But that three leaves the one that lynn showed was a little bit better because the leaves weren't quite as separate um kind of remember reminds you of the footprint that a goat leaves with his little hooves mm -hmm. so that's where that name came from um as far as being called bishop's weed or gout weed anyway this was actually grown for a long time in monastic gardens because gout was considered one of those diseases that was a disease of kings because you had to eat really well and drink really well in order to have uric acid levels high in your blood from your diet so this was definitely something that had been used to treat everybody from roman emperors through um bishops that would go to town to town just looking for their spoils um in the middle ages it is really good for um poulticing on joints for rheumatoid arthritis or for gout. You can do that with both the roots and the leaves. When the plant is in flower, you should be careful because it tends to have more of a laxative property. Um, the rest of the time, it's just great as an anti-rheumatic, as a diuretic, and as a sedative. So if you're having swelling as well as being in pain, then this will help to remove the fluid from your body. It will help to lessen the pain as well as um, just make you feel overall better. Um, that's pretty much it. I just again, the consideration whenever you're eating wild foods, you don't want to go hog wild and eat like all that you see because you might do yourself a bit of mischief. Mm -hmm. So um, please be just mindful that when it is in flour, if you eat too much of it, then you could be in the bathroom for the rest of the evening. Keep that in mind. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to um, also add um, is that let me just go back to the plant profile. It um, okay. It, it it looks an awful lot like also eastern uh, water leaf, and um, and there we found that in um, okay. So so you can see a little bit of the similarity there, and uh, we found them uh, growing at, at uh, Pennypack Park uh, side by side. Now this is a variegated uh, type of that as well. So, um, so the eastern water leaf and the um, and the uh, goutweed are 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 very similar. 
um, uh, to each other. Okay, any questions about the gout weed? Okay, so now you know gout weed is to help cure gout. So that's, I love names of plants where they explain what they do. It makes it so much easier. Now, going from Bishop's gout weed to Devil's Walking Stick. <laughs> I love this. Um, so Devil's Walking Stick is, um, is a bush. So I've got to go over here under bushes. There's Devil's Walking Stick. Um, and so this is, um, it's, it's really um, proliferates um, uh, um, everywhere. So here are all, yes, here, are, it, you can't really hold on to the devil's walking stick. That's why they call it devil's walking stick. Um, so it has all these uh, thorns coming out of it. Now they can look at different, uh, I think Danny's got a different picture um, uh, of, of that. Um, but here's what the, the branch looks like, uh, which is interesting. Um, a little bit of a um, fern or palm kind of quality to it. Here are the uh, blossoms that come out in the fall or whatever. Now, this is the part when we, we talk about a shoot. Normally we think of shoots as coming out of the ground, but with the devil's walking stick, you're talking about shoots coming out of either the top of, of the, um, and you can see one a, a little further down um, this, the, the stalk. If you see that little green bud coming out, that's also a shoot. They can come out in the, you know, the elbow of a of between the branch and the stalk so they they can come out different places so that's what you're looking at you're not looking for something coming out of the ground um these are the uh, fruit which look an awful lot like pokeweed fruit to a certain extent mm -hmm. uh, but that's um the the fruit is not edible and this is this is the height they they get to uh so it's sort of a sumac height sumac uh, bushes get to about the same height it kind of looks like that so there can be some, you know, confusion there, but the confusion will all go away if you go up to the trunk and touch on that. Now, I want to um, also talk about there is a similar uh, bush, and that's called prickly ash, and um, this is its um, trunk. Now, some of this looks like it's been cut off, but it, it almost looks like a dinosaur trunk. And uh, prickly ash, here's, here's another picture that's an older trunk, but it really is, it's just really, you know, uh, it looks ancient. Um, again, like a, a, the dinosaur it's trying to mimic. Uh, and, and there again, it's not a huge tree. Uh, mm -hmm. The prickly ash is called the toothache tree. Um, so we can talk about that at another time, but I'm just trying to um, uh, draw the comparison that these two both have trunks that uh, you do, you wouldn't want to grab onto exactly. So, but sometimes a uh, devil's walking stick, which is um, Aurelia Spinoza is, um, is called Hercules club, which is what, um, you know, uh, which is what uh, prickly ash is also called. Well, let me go back. Um, so there you go um, with, um, you know, as Danny says, sometimes you need the Latin. Um, there is a confusion over, um, over these, uh, where am I with these devil's walking? Let me go back to the devil's walking stick. Um, so let's see, under the bushes, there it is. Um, so anyway, sometimes there is some confusion. So I, I'm i basically not putting down as another common name under devil's walking stick, Hercules Club, because I don't wanna to add to the confusion. I think Hercules Club is, is more often considered associated with prickly, uh, ash, otherwise known as the toothache tree, uh, because the 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 fruit uh, numbs the mouth, and it's also a substitute for like Szechuan pepper. So um, so that is not devil's walking stick, however. So so we want to sort of separate the two. I I think I made that about as clear as mud, right? <laughs> Don't worry, I got you covered, babe. Okay, thank you very much, Danny, to the rescue. Okay, well, um, let's show you this and maybe we can get a little more clarity. Um, this is Devil's Walking Stick, Aurelia Spinoza. When you see it, I mean, yes, Lynn is right. The, the 
name situation is crazy with these two plants because you just said about toothache plant. Well, devil's walking stick actually has been used for toothache pain. Uh -huh. So that doesn't help the situation either. Um, and one of the things when you see them together, then you can see, whereas devil's walking stick or Aya Spinoza has more of actual spiky um, projectiles. When you look at um, Xanthosylum clava her herculeum, um, then you see the projectiles are much more kind of quirky like and more triangular projectiles as opposed to really jagged spiny looks like it's gonna hurt you. Well, they almost look like teeth. They almost look yeah. like teeth protruding a little bit from the Her Hercules Club. Right. Yeah. So, um, but Devil's Walking Stick was also known as um, Angelica Tree because when you see the top of the white flowers that comes out, it kind of reminds you in the way that Angelica blooms. So this is a natural analgesic, anti-inflammatory. It promotes movement of fluids. So um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it's diaphoretic, which means it helps you sweat. It's an emetic. Uh, so if you have eaten something wrong and you want to vomit, it works for that, as well as a silagogue so that it gets your mouth and fluids running in your mouth. So you start to <laughs> not dribble, but you know what I mean? It, it gets your salivary glands working is what, what I was reaching for. Mm -hmm. So this tree is actually a member of the ginseng family. So it does work um, for toothache. It does help with rheumatism. Um, it's rich in antioxidants. Um, they used to actually take the berries um, that Lynn showed you, the black berries, and soak them in brandy and then use that um, liquid as needed for things like rheumatism or a toothache. Uh, the Cherokee used to make a salve out of it. And that was for swelling and for boils and skin issues. And there was also a poultice of roots that's used for boils and swelling. Um, a cold infusion of the root was also used for eye drops for people that had sore eyes. So before the time of Visine and he had burning itchy eyes, that was what was used. And the one thing that you have to be worried about is I did mention it's a medic, but the fresh bark is incredibly emetic. So um, if you want to try to see what this will do for you, um, you can certainly use the inner bark, uh, you can, but you wanna just be careful because um, you don't wanna get into a situation where it's got too much of a laxative or emetic effect and you end up dehydrating yourself. The new um, information I found out about this was back in Civil War time when blockades were preventing medications from traveling between North and South. There was a doctor, Francis Poacher, in the South, and he had to figure out a way to treat soldiers that were coming to him. And what they asked him to do was to start investigating what kind of medicines could be found in the wilderness nearby. And of his studies, he actually found three trees that worked as natural antibiotics. And the information it's kind of touchy because he was um, originally a Confederate. He was a slaveholder. So a lot of people were like, oh, do you want to really pay attention to um, his writings? But the information holds up because uh, tulip poplar and white oak and devil's walking stick are now showing consistently that they have the ability to fight infections like staph. And now that we're dealing with um, resistant strains that, you know, antibiotics are just, they're completely useless. It's really good to have the information that you can go back on because this may be incorporated in the next generation of developments for, you know, MRSAs and things that have been super bugs. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Any questions? Any questions about um, Devil's Walking Stick? Okay. Now we're going to go into the uh, Iffy edibles. All right. This is um, this is something that most people don't do, but um, I just Being feel brave or foolish. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, so these are iffy edibles. So they do have poisonous parts. Um, but I, I I noticed years ago that uh, Plants for a Future, which is considered you know the gold standard of foragers. Uh, was had other things to say about them. So we're gonna we're gonna start with um, lesser celandine. Uh, now lesser celandine, let 
Does this look familiar to everyone? The, so it's it's it spreads all over the place. It has a beautiful uh, yellow uh, flower, um, and uh, it's in the buttercup uh, family. Now, I didn't think it was associated with greater celandine, and some websites say it's not. But then I read somewhere that oh yeah, the um, Green Dean of EatTheWeeds.com said it, it. They both are a member of the buttercup family. So um, so that that's kind of interesting. But this is what it looks like. Now, when it gets to this point with the yellow flowers and all of that, that's not when you eat it. Um, so, so here are the flowers. You, if you're going to eat it, uh, you have to do that beforehand. Um, now, uh, I, I do wanna say, going back to the iffy edibles, I've got a, a page on iffy edibles. And uh, basically uh, what, what I say is most websites and foragers either do not address these plants or um, um, say, don't eat them entirely. Um, however, there are exceptions in PFAF, like I said, is, is one of the exceptions. So um, what I did find, I, I put under, under each of these um, plants of the ones I've gotten to so far. Otherwise, you just link to PFAF. Um, so at any rate, um, the, um, so the parts that are edible for the lesser celandine would be the leaf and the root. Um, I would cook them both. I would not eat them raw. Uh, and, um, and then, uh, you know, basically they're saying that's an excellent salad. Again, if the flowers and the buds are coming out, that's not the time to do it. I've, I've read some websites where they, um, they um, promote the idea of actually, um, um, if you know where they are, if you remove some of the, um, uh, the foliage on the ground, you can see they're white. The, the plants are actually white. They haven't gone green yet. And that's even a better time to, to harvest them. Um, but in any way, it's, 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 I would only eat um, a teeny bit of it if you, if you try to eat it. Um, you know, uh, again, with um, going back to the iffy edibles, uh, I have how to test if a plant is edible. That's the same test if, if you're going to be allergic to it or have a a reaction to it. Um, and the reason I'm so interested in these plants is because they are so abundant that I want to know what their uses are. Because when you have something that's this abundant, um, you really want to uh, be able to take advantage of it if it's uh, at all possible. Again, I did, I, I did have some small um, uh, experience with them. Um, and I felt it was kind of um, uh, bitter but um, but that's not uh, you know that that may not be necessarily a bad thing. Um, but I don't have a lot of experience with this. But you should just know that Plants for a Future does say that they're edible, um, and um, you know that's and and then there are some other interestingly because Danny's got a connection with the. Uh, Scotland and the UK and all that. And I noticed the Scottish seem to have a very a, a, a big interest in this plant. So the Scottish Forest Garden has has some um, some advice on eating lesser celandine. So so Danny, why don't you take it away? Okay. Uh, gotcha. All right. Um I don't want to disagree with um, Green Dean, but um, I'm gonna say what I say and take it for what it, it's worth. Yeah. Um, this is Lester Celandin, um, it's Ficaria verna. It was previously Ranoculus Ficaria. Um, it does, this is it next to greater Celandin, Chelidonia magus. Here's the deal. Lester Celandin is actually a member of um, Ranoculus buttercup family. However, greater celandine is actually a member of the poppy family. So when you're talking about medicinal benefits, lesser celandine has fewer than greater celandine mm -hmm. um, because greater celandine being part of the poppy family, then it's got uh, natural properties that are good for skin as well as naturally sedative. So that's a whole nother um, situation. When you're dealing with lesser celandine, it's really only used for one thing and that is for hemorrhoids. This used to be in a category of plants that they called pile warts, which could also in England refer to 
erectites periactifolia or burn weed, which was also used, um, you would kind of do it like a sitz bath and it would help tighten because it's naturally astringent and it would help um, tighten the skin. Oops, went too far. Um, it's antimicrobial, but it's also cytopathic. And that's where, um, you know, when you're saying about an iffy edible, you should be really, really careful about this because plants in general, 3% of all plants have pyrolyzidine alkaloids, which means it's the plant's natural defense system that keeps things from eating it. So it keeps bugs and other predators away. So for most people that can just be rinsed through your body. It's not gonna to be too much of a big deal. You do have to watch how much you're having as far as quantity, because you don't want it to build up into your system. However, the whole buttercup family has another toxin called protoanemonin. And although it shows antimicrobial properties, it is cytopathic. So it will kill both healthy and unwell cells. Um, it's one of those things that people will probably be studying to try and figure out how they can target it more to just kill unhealthy cells. But right now they don't have the ability to do that. And in its natural state, it can be dangerous. So um, the general rule for any of the herbal books and research that I've done says that this should not be ingested fresh at all. Now, if you want to cook it, if roots are a viable edible from what Lynn was saying, I mean, go to the site and check it out, then have at it. But I definitely would stay away from having this raw. Um, just err on the side of caution. If, if it says that you can eat it cooked, then go for that. Um, I definitely wouldn't want to put anybody at risk by saying that you can just eat this raw. I mean, take it at its own risk. But with those two toxins that we know exist in the plant, I'd be really careful. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, let me, um, I don't know if I did this or not, but did, did I show the, yeah, so that's, that's what the roots look like, the piles. <laughs> exactly. Gives me a little itch just looking at it. <laughs> so, anyway, um, yeah, so that's what those bilbus, bil, you know, bulbs, bilbobs, or something like that. Uh, that's what they look like. So, um, so when you dig them up, uh, and 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 there again, this is what the uh, the leaf looks like. And uh, just again, um, going back to the um, home page, I've got this uh, lookalikes, and I I I do have that in there. Um, so uh, the lesser celandine with the wild violet, with the garlic mustard, and the common mallow you know, these things. So it helps you uh, differentiate between some of these plants. Um, okay, so let's go back to the, any questions on the um, lesser celandine? Oh, let me stop the screen share. Uh, any questions on the lesser celandine? Yeah, okay. So, um, all right, so let's go to the next one, which is the uh, groundsel. Again, this is a plant um, I was always um, interested in and I did, um, I did have a little, I have, uh, I have eaten it. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's interesting because you see those blossoms and um, you think, oh, it's gonna be like a, um, a dandelion, but no, when it blossoms out, it's like a dandelion going to seed right away. That's what you get. You never get the yellow flower. Um, as compared to the south thistle, which it looks like. Uh, this is this is not the same thing. So the ground the groundsel. Um, so when you see it in nature, it's going to kind of look like that. If you can kind of see, it's it, it stays kind of short and scrubby looking. Um, lots of buds on it. Um, these are the the shapes of the leaves. Gives you an idea with the just just the, the little pricks at the at the edge. Um, and then this is one of your, it's not such a great, um, but it shows the root structure and, and all of that. Um, so this is, um, you can find this, well, I found it behind the art museum on the lawn. Um, it seems to like some shade and moist areas. I love the taste of it. I, I, it was just like a lettuce taste with a little bit of bitterness to it. Um, uh, radicchio, a little bit of that taste, I think, to it. Um, but 
it, it also has some toxins in it that they say are cumulative and, and could, um, it, it, so this is, um, oh, okay. So this is plants for a future. So, um, you know, they have the warnings and all of that, but then you, you, you go down here and it says leaves raw or cooked, you know, in many areas you're using a salad. Uh, so they say this is very inadvisable and then basically this cumulative toxin uh, liver thing, um, but people do use it. Um, so, uh, and, and the thing is, it's mostly toxic. Um, I think that uh, it might be more toxic to um, wildlife. Um, anyway, the other thing about it is very good for caterpillars and a butterfly uh, species and that sort of thing. They've talked about the cinnabar uh, moth caterpillar, which I should have shown. Oh, here's the sow thistle. Um, so it looks similar to that. Uh, but the sow thistle is, uh, you know, it ends up looking like this, go, growing straight up with the yellow blossoms, that sort of thing. And this is more of a, um, this is more of a winter uh, cool weather plant. Um, so this, you're not gonna find this in the heat of the summer. Um, and, and again, it's, it's one of your iffy edibles, uh, but th there are some, um, you know, there's some commentary on it. Um, if you have a nibble of it, I don't think it's, you know, that's, that's not gonna hurt you. Uh, but I'd like to see more research uh, done on this as far as the edibility it is concerned. Danny. Okay. I'll tell you, this one um, took some doing. Let's see, where is it? Oh, sorry, went too far. Um, I was searching around for this um, after we talked and initially um, Seneca vulgaris, there wasn't a lot of information on what it was used for medicinally. However, I did find loads of references saying that it has been used in history, but it was just not considered an official plant as part of their apothecary. So um, we do know that uh, because of vitamin C content, it's good to fight scurvy, which is what an antiscorbutic is. It's an antithelmintic, so it drives out worms. It's diaphoretic, it will make you sweat. It's diuretic, a menagogue, so if you're pregnant or if you um, have an absent period, this will start it, and it's a purgative. Um, I actually did find that in homeopathy, it's used and a highly diluted version was done for menstrual disorders and for nosebleeds. But I had to go back several hundred years to my dear brother Aloysius who talked extensively about this. I mean, I had gone through Kew Gardens and a whole bunch of other texts before I found any information. And he actually suggested it for things like epilepsy, he said that if you did like a quarter cup of the weed to two cups of boiled water and took that as a tea, that would help with epilepsy. He encouraged the use of boiled flowers to make a poultice at, that you could apply to the outside of your stomach. Mm -hmm. um, he also encouraged drinking the sap of groundsel by the spoonful, no more than six teaspoons a day on an empty stomach. And he felt that that would relieve pain in the loins, which again ties into its use for menstrual cycles. Um, the other thing he recommends is mixing it with either wine or lard and applying it to sores, burning, and swelling of your anus or genitals. So that's a good night in. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. I'm going to try it. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Any questions on the groundsel? Has anybody seen this plant uh, and wondered about it? Well, now you've been introduced. <laughs> It's still a mystery, <laughs> but um, but it tastes really good. I liked it, uh, but I didn't make a habit of eating it. But um, anyway, okay. So, all right. So for our last plant, uh, okay, let's go. Of the iffy edibles, just because they're here, um, is um, the um, I'll start with this one. Is the Star of Bethlehem. Now I know most people think the Star of Bethlehem is is poisonous, and uh, and the and the leaves are, but the flower and the root uh, are not. Uh, the root, according to um, PFAF, and the flower is according to everyone. Um, so uh, so anyway, this is what it would look like now. Um, 
and it can be confused with snowdrops. I don't have actually, I don't think I have a picture of the snowdrops. I should have put that in there. But um, snowdrops have a, a, a white blossom that's always hanging, like it's always waiting for the snow to fall on its head. So it doesn't come out like this. The snowdrop is always facing downward. Uh, so the um, so the star of uh, Bethlehem. So so here, let me go. Let me look at this. See, the star of Bethlehem is always looking up. It's it's always looking up. So um, and I think it's closed if the sun isn't out. I think that's the deal with that. Uh, but um, so you can see what it looks like and um, and and look at that that. Um, that uh, leaf coming up. Now that's kind of the part that's poisonous that the um, animals get into, and that's not good for for some mammals. Not not all mammals, but some. Um, and that's growing up everywhere. So this is a very you know, particularly you know, at Lemon Hill, uh, Lemon Hill, when we cross the street from the Cosmic Cafe to go over to go up the steps, it's all over the place. So you're you're. This is. Uh, this is something people think it's grass, but it's not, or they might think it's like um, onion grass or garlic grass or whatever, and it's it's not. Um, it's it, and and that you can tell because it's got that white streak in it. It's a thicker leaf, um, and if you dug it out, the bulb is not. And here's the bulbs. This is a picture of bulbs I took the other day. So this is like an oak leaf here. And you can see the size of the bulbs. Those are pretty big, but they have smaller ones too. If you see the smaller ones there, a little higher up in the picture off to the right, um, those, are, those are also what came out of the ground. So they're quite good sized um, bulbs. Um, and um, so um, I'll let Danny get into the cautions and, and the uh, medicinal uh, um, uh, side of it. Um, the other thing um, that differentiates is, is the flowers come off and, you know, with these uh, stems. So uh, a snowdrop, it's just one, one stem. And again, it's not looking up, it's looking down. Um, it's interesting also, because when we took our tour last weekend, uh, we went up, uh, we got up the, so we saw the, you know, we saw um, the Star of Bethlehem at this stage, we couldn't see any flowers or anything. And then we went up the hill and right outside the gate and uh, were snowdrops. I'm like, oh my gosh, there they are. The snowdrops, the, um, the, the, the sphere there is much wider and thicker. So it's like rubbery. It has a bit of a, a line to it, but it's not as distinctive as this white line, you know, the white center of this uh, of this uh, leaf. So, um, so, so it was nice to see. And they were those blossoms were already out, whereas the Star of Bethlehem aren't out yet. Um, uh, but this is this is another picture. So the the leaves are used in baking, and and uh, not the leaves. I'm sorry, the flowers are used in baking. And, and then the bulb can be raw or cooked. So last night I did, or yesterday, I did in the, in the midday morning-ish, I did dig up some of these and I did take a little bite of a, of a raw one. And, it, and, and the taste was not acidy or anything. It was a bland, I felt it was a bland taste. So then I cooked some and, and washed it off and took another little bite. Um, and again, not much taste, uh, no real reaction to it. Um, and then in the evening, we watched a, um, an episode of Doc Martin. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, oh, I hope I didn't do the wrong thing. So, but no, I'm fine. <laughs> But it's a little, you know, so that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go very slowly, um, you know, uh, and, and again, PFAF is, is quite clear. Now, although they do have, they do have a, um, you know, a warning on it. Um, but, um, and, and it's, it's, it's basically, I think, they said the bulb is uh, poisonous to grazing animals. They've got one reference for that. The edibility is three, which is interesting, a medicinal rating as well. But um, 
But anyway, here are the edible parts, the flour and the root. They say ball, bra, or cooked. But I would say to be on the safe side, just cook it and throw off the water and then just take a teeny little bite. But I'm not advising you to eat it at all. Let's make that clear. Um, all of this iffy edible is at your own, you know, at your own risk. But so now you know, at least with all these Star of Bethlehem coming on up, that there is at least one organization with a fantastic reputation that says those bulbs are edible. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. Annie? <laughs> okay. I hate one. Sorry. All righty. Um, Star of Bethlehem. Ornithogallum umbilatum. Um, the name Ornithogallum, Ornitho for bird and gallum for white, because supposedly when the petals are open, and actually when you see it fully open, it you can kind of get the idea of like the body of a bird and then wings. So I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, supposedly one of the reasons it was called Star of Bethlehem was that um, after the birth of Jesus and God was so pleased with the star as like his little sat nav system to the world. He didn't want to just destroy it. So he instead gave the power into the plant. So there you go, your very own little star of Bethlehem. This has been used as a decongestant uh, for both heart and lung congestion. But um, that I have less information on than the fact in homeopathy or in uh, flower remedies, the flower essence is used for PTSD. And they really felt that it helps with extreme distress and shock. So it doesn't just have to be, you know, vets that are coming back, but anybody that's suffering from um, incredible accident or loss or um, people with serious depression, it can be helpful. In fact, if you've ever used or, um, or know about Bach flower remedies, the rescue remedy, this is actually one of the components in that. Um, like Lynn said, it does contain pyrolyzing alkaloids, so it can be toxic if you have too much of it at a long period of time, but much of that can be ameliorated by cooking. So if you want to try the bulbs, then maybe that's the way to go. Um, as a tincture, though, it can be helpful for people that are having heart issues or people that suffer from COPD, as well as swelling um, and edema in the ankles. So it might be useful for that. The only problem that I have with that, um, and that being said, is if you are a person that suffers from um, heart failure or issues like that, this may be helpful as an emergency treatment, but generally speaking, you're probably going to be on some other medication anyway, so I'm not really sure that your doctor would want you to go dickering around with something that may um, either lessen the effectiveness or um, exacerbate what you're already taken. So um, keep it in mind that if you want to experiment with this, if you are on it, drugs for like COPD or heart issues, you might want to be careful. That doesn't mean that you can't eat the bulb. Um, because you might want to try that. And sometimes it's just the quantities that we have. Sometimes it's just, you can eat something and you're fine with it, but to distill it down to a tincture to take as a medicinal might not be the route for you. So that's it. I muted myself. <laughs> any okay. questions about that? Okay, does anybody have any experience with Star of Bethlehem? Yes, Norma, I see you nodding. Yeah, it's all over my yard. Oh. Uh, I call them fairy flowers. I, I just love them. I think they're very, very pretty. And I have made flower essence. Um, I haven't really used it, but I have flower essence. Um, I was wondering, um, Lady Danny, um, for the swelling of the ankles, you would tincture the flowering tops? No, bulb. You tincture the bulb, okay. So what about the uh, P, uh, PTSD? Uh, how would you handle the flower? I mean, how would you prepare the flower? Or yeah, flower essence is like an involved process. You take the flower and you have to put it on water, but you have to keep it in an area that's not in direct sunlight, but you don't want necessarily things overhanging it. And then after it absorbs the vibration of that, then you add equal amounts of that to say brandy. And then that becomes your mother. And then from that, you would put a few drops into another bottle that you're putting um, brandy or something in. And then that is your final product that you take a few drops of. Oh my God. 
it sounds very complicated. It's it's not that it's just like a, a more of a time consuming thing than an actual difficulty level. But okay. because it's so diluted down, you know that what you're getting really is it's just like when you do homeopathy and you get the little pastilles they are like a tiny, tiny amount of what, you know, the original product was. Yeah. So for people that are suffering from PTSD, it's just enough to help with, you know, it's, it's, it's not a magic bullet. None of this stuff is, but it does help ease the process, especially if you're going into other kinds of therapies to assist with that. What if you were just to eat the flour? I have no information. I mean, all the, um, the things that I've read on making and using is all about the bulb. That doesn't mean that you can't, but. Hmm. Okay. Interesting though. I'm eating the flowers. You eat, you eat the flowers? Yeah, not not a lot of them, but I, you know, when they're there, I uh, I eat one or two. And are you a happy person? Because yeah. <laughs> I have a, I, have, <laughs> I think someone in my family could use it. <laughs> okay. Like I said, it's a fairy flower. It makes a lovely garnish for a salad. So, okay. All right. So, has anybody used anyone else used uh, Star of Bethlehem the flower? Anybody else? Okay. Um, all right. So, um, in general, okay. So that basically wraps up our um, our meetup for for tonight. Um, I think we and it's eight thirty. I can't believe it. We like nailed it. <laughs> yeah. So I don't like to drag these things out, but um, we're we're gonna try to have this um, once a month. I'm not sure what happened to um, all the other, um, is it still recording? Okay, all the other people were supposed to be coming in. Um, and so I have a feeling it is something to do with the way the invitation went out or that they couldn't get on on their phone. I noticed somebody couldn't get on on their phone. So I'm not sure if that's if that's a problem or not. So we'll, we'll have to look into that. Um, but uh, once a month, Danny and I are planning on doing this, um, right, Danny? Yep. Yep. And, yeah. And, and the good thing about this, um, doing it this way is, um, and I didn't do this the first time because I was just so traumatized by just doing this at all. I wasn't really um, clicking onto the um, pictures, but that's really important to get into those pictures because then you can have a chance to really look at the plant. Whereas when we're out touring and I'm doing the tours and I'm pass passing around the plants, people are kind of looking at them, but they, you know, they're kind of in shock to seeing all this new information, new things, and they're not really absorbing it. So it's nice to know that, you know, you can, if you can relax and have a chance to, to look at the plant parts and um, really have a chance to look at them closely and identify them. Again, um, this is all on the website. So all those are, um, those plant profiles have these, um, what do you call it? thumbnails, so you can uh, help educate yourself. If in going through um, any part of the website, you have any criticisms or comments or additions you wanna make, just please email me directly. Don't go through Meetup because that that's kind of weird. I don't get half those messages, it seems. Um, so just email me directly because I always enjoy that, um, that information. Um, uh, again, uh, I wanna thank you for coming. If anybody has anything else they wanna say, um, you know, how about everybody unmute themselves and say, see you next time. <laughs> I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been great. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank 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 you, Lady Danny, too. Thank you so much. Danny, yeah. Yeah, she really, she really adds that great. Um, meat to the bones. Mm -hmm. And great. I really appreciate it. Okay, so see you next time. Thank you very much. It's Thank you. We're, the, Elvis is leaving the building. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.